Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wholesale Change. It's the webcast and the podcast from Distribution Strategy Group, where we offer thought leadership for a wholesale change agents like you, because if you're on this show, you probably are a wholesale change agent. And if you're not, stick around and we'll make you into one. My name is Ian Huller. I'll be your co-host today, along with my business partner. And not only is he the doctor of distribution, but this is a true story. Jonathan is a concert pianist, classical music pianist, oh, God. and he's a brilliant mathematician, which means he's got what? Algorithm. <laughs> oh, man. Ian, you just made the, off the audience an offer they can't refuse. <laughs> you know, nobody has hung up yet. I mean, that's a good thing, right? We still have them all. So, you know, I saw something yesterday that said, it's, it said about the odds of a, of a certain storm happening. Uh -huh. And it occurred to me, what if we could like bet on weather? I mean, you, mm. you can bet on some pretty bizarre things, right? Yeah. You know, what, what if like Vegas is making odds on weather and you could bet on weather? Yeah, maybe they are. I don't, I mean, I think uh, it's a great idea. I think it's a monetization opportunity for you. I mean, I'm just going to ride your coattails as usual. <laughs> Because you're the brilliant uh, numerologist. Get out, Get out of here. So okay. anyway, hey, we've got a fantastic topic today, right? So we love this topic, but we're going to go deeper than we normally do into it. So it's why shopping cart sales are a small part of website ROI. So, you know, it's interesting to me, Jonathan, because we talk to distributors from all over the world, right? Yeah. And when we talk to them, what's the primary way that they measure ROI on their website? They look at the revenue going through the shopping cart, or the gross, gross profits, gross margin going through the shopping cart, measured by the cost of capital costs of e-commerce and any expense costs. So the capital costs would be like an implementation fee, it's typically right. capitalized, right? And then um, some software costs, right, software costs, but then, and then they're going to be paying annual or annual um, subscription. Right. Most of these, most of these headcount platforms are on, are on a SaaS basis now, right? It's not sure. It's not on-prem software. So, so those are the things that go into the denominator. And I think really your brilliant insight enough about my brilliance, your brilliant insight was we got to think about the numerator. We got to think about not just, the sales from the shopping cart. We got, there's a bunch of other things going to the numerator that we're going to talk about. Yeah. That are that shift the way you should be thinking about this. And I think if we go back to really the dawn of distribution e-commerce, the, the dawn was right around 2000, right during that during that bubble, and um, people held out the belief they were going to get rich with e-commerce. Like, oh, great, you know, you you talk to um, CEO or an owner and they say, yeah, we're, we're going to start selling nationally. A mm -hmm. lot of people said, we're going to start selling nationally. Right. Everybody had that idea. And I think what's happened is we, we've really settled into um, a pretty tight pattern of what e-commerce looks like based on the sector you're in. Yeah. So some sectors have more than other. None have a lot to your point, right? Mm -hmm. But some have more than others. So I guess if we use the George Orwell, some are more equal than others. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, and in general, that percentage is rising year over right. year. Um, our colleague Dean Mueller is, is really the, the, the whiz kid on this. You know, we're tracking that year over year. It is going up, but it is still not a lot. Even, even the most is not a lot, which is kind yeah. of your point, right? Yeah. I mean, we talked about this before the show, but, you know, I think, um, you know, first of all, if you have questions, audience, live audience, please send them in. Um, so I think, you know, when I, when we look at the numerator, you know, so the revenue side and when distributors lock in on this, you know, shopping cart revenue and the study that you and Dean just did was I think the first rigorous analysis of the real numerator, the real revenue mm -hmm. from a website that went beyond the shopping cart. And I can't wait for you to go into that. Um, but I think we need to, to define why that numerator is incomplete. Why does it happen that those revenues don't come through the shopping cart? And there are really two main drivers in my mind. One is that a lot of customers can't check out through your shopping cart because they have to use a purchasing system. So 
they're going to get a PO. They're going to fill out a PO. They're going to have it um, approved by somebody. And then they're going to email that thing in or they're going to um, send it in by EDI or through an e-procurement you know, uh, a system. They're not going to check your check out with your shopping cart because they can't. So they may shop on your shopping cart all day long, or excuse oh, me, on your sorry. website. On yeah. your website, yeah, sorry. Uh, but they're not going to place the order through it because they have to place the order through an alternative method because they have a purchasing system, and the website gets zero of that attribution, even if it generated the whole order. And what's the second reason? Second reason is an idea that you had. Which is that you <laughs> the the second reason is that the website is the only channel that you can't get discounts through. That's right. Because if I talk to a person, I can get a discount. And everybody knows it. So your website becomes your most expensive channel. Customers aren't stupid; they figure that out. And you know, so distributors. And I'm not criticizing the need for pricing authority. I mean, I think obviously many distributors can tighten up and do a good, do a better job. But as long as I can call somebody, like my sales rep or the inside salesperson I develop a relationship with, or who likes to give away price, which is many of them, um, why would I place the order through the website? I make a phone call, I get five ten percent off. Yeah, it, that, that's assuming I don't already have contract pricing on the item that I'm buying. Um, right. Which in any good e-commerce site is available once I log in, right? Yeah. Then, then I see my pricing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it, even it, even then, it is almost guaranteed to be the most expensive, right? Yeah, you're certainly not going to be cheaper. You're not going to be cheaper. Yeah. And and so I think so. So I think what was interesting about the study that you and Dean did, and I want to get to that as quickly as possible, but I want to talk about the sectors too. And you have a lot of expertise in which sectors are selling more or less online, but the the website's doing all this work. There's these investments in technology that distributors have made to build these digital capabilities, they are paying off, but they don't know it because it's not coming through the shopping cart. It's, it's really ironic because in, in a very real sense, digital marketing is the most measurable marketing medium we've ever had. Yet, there is this gap that we're talking about here, right? Which That's is, such a great insight. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, we in, in marketing, we were struggling with attribution for years. We finally get the perfect attribution channel and we can't measure it. <laughs> we can't measure the we can't measure getting the across the whole line. We can measure yeah. everything up until then, right? Yeah. And I think you know what happens, Jonathan, is a lot of distributors wind up building the wrong websites because they hear, you know, so-called experts say your B2B site should be like your B2C site. And so they go, okay, well, I'm gonna build a site that relies on SEO. Uh, uh, pay-per-click, uh, email marketing to draw people to my site. And then I'm going to drive them to my shopping cart uh, to convert them. And if they don't convert them, I'm going to use retargeting to annoy them forever to get them to check out. When the customer the whole time was never intending to check out, they're using the shopping cart as a quote cart, quote builder, because you don't have a quote builder on your site. And they've already copied and pasted that data out of your shopping cart into a PO and placed the order but you're continuing to annoy them about, please, hey, hey, you left items in your cart and they already bought those items in the cart. So, I mean, I think you, you should have a quote cart, not just a shopping cart, first of all, mm -hmm. a quote builder, right? Um, and that would help with attribution too, right? I mean, if you had if you had a bunch of stuff in your quote cart, you, that would be very easy to match up to your transaction stream because it'd be customer specific, right? Yeah, and I think this is this is one of, one of your many brilliant insights, but that, that <laughs> There, there is an MRO style purchase, right? right. And, 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 and that style purchase has simpler transactions. It could be by credit card. It wouldn't have to necessarily be by PO. There's typically very little value add from the distributor in those simple MRO style transactions. Um, and a lot of people stub their toes or maybe their entire foot um, on, hey, let's build, a, let's build an e-commerce site and be like Granger. And then they found out that our model our model is not Granger's model. Mm -hmm. it, that was that was never going to work. Mm -hmm. And they may be on the second generation of their e-commerce platform, right? The first one didn't work. Okay, let's try a new platform. And it's still they're still not getting it through. And it's not about the e-commerce platform. It's about how your end customers buy in the sector that you're in. Um, and and that goes back to what you were saying about you know they, they may be required to be use a purchasing system. Yeah. 
So why don't you go through sort of the differences in performance by sector, you know, give us a few highlights and then get into this really in-depth analysis that you and Dean Mueller did that really nailed down what the true ROI is because you were able to estimate the benefits beyond the shopping cart for websites. Terrific. Yeah, there, there are really meaningful differences in sectors that tie back to product complexity, to how you need to purchase, et cetera. So at, at the upper end of revenue going through the shopping cart is the whole Jan San world. And it's, it's really astounding. I've seen some pretty underwhelming looking e-commerce sites in Jansan mm -hmm. that are generating 30 and 35% e-commerce revenue. And there's something about the nature of the transaction. Now, um, again, you know, if, if it's a large institution that's buying, um, you know, if it's a large hospital system or a university or a large corporation, that's not going through the shopping cart. Um, but but th that would be at the upper end. And I think even before the Janstan world got going, um, the world of what would you call the, the DigiKey as opposed to Arrow? Would you call that design electronics? Yeah, for DigiKey, it's, prime. it's either design or MRO demand for electronic components. So you're, you're either building prototypes or uh, right. you're doing repairs or very small production runs. Right. And, yeah. And so as, as, as contrast to the era, which is a big production supply thing, right? Uh, where literally you might be buying a million of a component that costs less than a penny. I mean, <laughs> that's a real thing. So, so that's yeah. at the really extreme end. But then as you start to come down from that, you start to look at the, the PEM sector, the plumbing, elect electrical, mechanical, um, and those might be, and by the way, some of this includes not just shopping cart, but people also included EDI punch out, email order processing uh, as, as part of their numbers, not all of them. So then you get to a sort of low teens, mid teens number. Now there's an important distinction really between plumbing, HVAC and electrical. Plumbing and HVAC look more similar. Electrical has part of their customer base could be industrial. They're doing industrial automation. Right. And those are, those are large companies. Again, that's not going through your shopping cart, no matter how much you want it to. Yeah. Uh, that's going to come from their purchasing system. So electrical is a little bit lower than the plumbing and HVAC for, for that so, reason, because plumbing and HVAC don't really have that, that automation industrial component. But they have the project aspect, which I think you mentioned yeah. that I didn't mention earlier, which is also a thing which is that, you know, if people are planning out like a, either a plant turnaround, right? So we're going to shut down for August and turn around the petrochem facility, or they're doing a construction project, that's not going to come through your website. That's right. Yeah, it's not eligible. Or if you want, you could use the term addressable. You know, what portion of your customer's <laughs> right. revenue is addressable by your website? Um, and then if we go down really even further, you know, we see things like the, the true building materials construction, which is kind of the example you just pointed out. Um, there are other um, in, in industrial sectors. Um, I'm, I'm thinking really about like the gas and welding sector. These, these are just not very high uh, shopping cart potential sectors. Um, and it comes back again to all the things that we've been saying. So so I think in summary, there is a range of revenue going through the shopping cart. Um, in no case is it a, on average, 50% or even 40% of the total business. And that means that a lot of the, the value of your e-commerce site um, is not showing up if we just look at what's happening in the shopping cart, right? Yeah, I think two takeaways though, that are two qualifiers. One is that this doesn't mean you don't need to have a great website. The, the story is your website is way overperforming versus what you're measuring. So your ROI on your previous investments is much higher than you think because you're not measuring the, the numerator correctly. Um, and uh, the other insight is, I had it just a second ago, it was brilliant. Um, the other insight is that, oh yeah, don't change your business model just to drive more sales through your website because that complexity is your friend because that simple stuff that anybody can buy online means anybody can sell it online. And so if you take out that complexity just to drive a higher website number, then you move your business right into the bullseye for digital players. That's right. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you become right into the bullseye for, for Jeff Bezos. 
Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, here's another discussion I had with a, with a client yesterday. It was more of a strategy session, corporate strategy than, than e-com strategy. But I said, look, they're rolling out their, their in industrial e-commerce. I said, are you guys going to be more like Granger or are you going to be more like Motion? Those are different ends of the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, as, as sort of prototypes, the motion has got a lot more complex transactions. I, obviously, I think they started to, to bring a lot more of the MRO, simple transactions, in, but they still have a huge swath of complex transactions. Or you're going to be more like more like Granger. And because what, what I'm really urging them to do, and this is really a message to, to the audience here, is you need to set the right expectation with your management. Or if you are the management, you need to set the right expectation with the next level down. Um, we've talked to any number of chief digital officers who are getting hammered by their CEO because there's not enough going through the shopping cart. And in fact, we've been engaged by large OEMs to help understand why entire sectors are not performing well. Right. Um, and it comes back to a lot of the things that, that we've been, we've been talking about here. So I'm really glad you said that because part of the problem is manufacturers think that the more going through the website, the better. Yeah. And our message is the more revenue generated by the website, the better. That doesn't mean it's coming through the shopping cart. That's right. Yeah. And so, so to your point, there is no excuse. Even if you have zero going through the shopping cart, there's no excuse for not having an impeccable website with great product data and information on it. Right. That should be, that should be your number one mission independent. And what we're going to show in, your, in a moment, actually what Dean showed when we when with this session a couple of weeks ago is, we had a we had two different distributors that had about one percent of their revenue going through the shopping cart, and the ROI on this thing was just crushing it, even with one percent going through. So, um, um, so there's no excuse for not having a really great shopping experience for your customers, independent of how they want to buy. Yeah, in fact, there's a company called Core in Maine, which used to be part of HD Supply when I was at the Construction Supplies Division, YCAP. And Brad Coles, who was, I think their CIO, then he became the COO, and he's now president of them now that they're spun out. He understood all this long before I did. And he, Corn Maine has got a fantastic website. I don't think they sell anything through it. You know, maybe some, wow. but I'm sure it's not much. But years ago, they had this fantastic customer portal and people could, you know, submit design specs and manage their own accounts and get all this technical information. That is a true competitive advantage for Core in Maine. People start buying from them because of that website capability. They do like monitoring of uh, electrical and water usage meters and oh, wow. all this stuff electronically. And they have a huge amount of stickiness. And my guess is, I don't even know if they know how much of the revenue is dependent on those capabilities, but I bet it's a very large amount without transacting on much anyway online. Yeah, uh, that's that's a great testimony to to everything that we've been talking about here. Um, should we talk about the maybe what else goes into the numerator here? Sure. Okay. So, you go ahead. No, no. Well, oh, well, I mean, I think you 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 worked on the study with Dean. Why don't you go into it? Okay. Um, so, the the main idea is again, if we go back to the simple numerator is just your shopping cart gross margin dollars. And what we're saying is that you should include those shopping cart gross margin dollars, but you should also include orders generated by the website, but placed via other channels. The, the most obvious ones are somebody sends an order by EDI after shopping on your site. Somebody sends an order by punch out. Somebody sends an order through email order automation like the Connexium. Um, that, that set of or that set of transactions, um, shopping cart, EDI punch out, um, email order automation, those are we, a term that you might have heard is which is lights out order processing. So if you can get if you can get if you can drive the revenue through any one of those, you do get the benefit of seven or eight dollars reduction in order entry cost per order. And that's that's a real thing. Obviously, you want your customers to do what they want to do. But to the extent that they can move towards that, um, that becomes a, a really meaningful ROI uh, as, the, as the percentages increase. The other things that happen is that 
your your digital kill capabilities start to drive the customer acquisition, and that can include um, the onboarding, the purchase frequency, um, growing wallet share, even in some cases retention and win back. So, so you're you're driving down your cost to serve, um, and you're getting the marketing benefit of the website plus um, what we what we refer as the website assist when it originates on the, the website and then it gets the order gets placed through another channel you, you want to talk about the the uh the point guard example ian you invented it i know but you but you found the chris paul um steph curry numbers <laughs> okay so um what jonathan came up with and i know this is the mutual admiration society today but it actually is a reflection of our true relationship um so uh, it, John, Jonathan Truck. He's, uh, he's the smartest guy in the room. Well, but to, to, to me, you're up there. So the windows <laughs> are in different places. So um, the, the 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 idea here is that depending on your business model, your website may play a different type of role like different point guards play in the NBA, right? So Steph Curry scores a lot, right? He shoots a lot. He passes less than he shoots. Um, Chris Paul, uh, who was the person you came up with as the corollary to that passes much more than he shoots. So if you look at their numbers over the, over, we, I think we did their careers through 2021 or something, you know, these, these are like 10 year careers. So there's a lot of data in here. What you see is that Steph Curry scores like a third more points than Chris Paul does directly, but he passes a lot more. So if you give two points of credit to the pass, and this is a measurement in the NBA, they call points created, right? Point creation. Mm -hmm. They are within one tenth of a point of each other over the course of their lifetimes, even though one scores much more and one passes much more. So, look, if you're in, you know, MRO and all, and you just sell packaged products, not a lot of value added services, or you're in janitorial, you you're can score great. a lot. You're yeah, your stuff, right? You're you're gonna your website's gonna shoot and score. If you are in, you know, plastics or um, uh, pipe and steel and many other industries, or you have a lot of value added services, your website is, uh, is Chris Paul. It's passing the, it's, it's, it's responsible for the points, but it's passing it off to another channel for the actual baskets. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yes. How'd I do? Was that good? You did great. You did oh, great. Good. Um, yeah. And so when we started to look at uh, a couple of companies that by, all internal metrics, old numerator, shopping cart, were considered not having met um, objectives. I could even use the term failure, right? At, at 1% e-commerce revenue, those were probably considered failures by the CEO looking at it through the old lens. But when we started to look at it through the new lens of the, 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 the richer numerator, what we found was that the the one the electrical distributor was getting about a 600% ROI assuming only 5% of the orders uh, that didn't go through the shopping cart were generated by the e-commerce site that's a modest it was a modest assessment only 5% gives you a 600% ROI and we have a way you can estimate that we do yes yeah, the the, uh, the other part of the estimate, estimation is to say, um, if you can look at Google Analytics or if you can look at something from a marketing automation, you can start to see where are the clicks going? Are the clicks going to things like account management or are the clicks going to things like product search? And in the analysis that Dean did, this, um, this particular distributor through Google Analytics, you can see that about 30% of the clicks were related to product search. Right. Um, and again, taking only a 5% of that 30%, 500 basis points of that uh, 3,000 basis points, um, taking only 5% gave us 600% ROI, right? That it was generating that much in assist. We, we felt that was conservative. And that was a very happy number to take back to, to the senior management for this company. And there, there were, there was good data there also about how digital engagement correlated to purchasing behavior, right? Totally, yeah. This this work that Dean did really quantified a belief that we've had for the longest time, and that's based on research we've done in 
how people shop and how they buy. And, and one of the big things we found when we started looking at how people shop, meaning evaluate and assess research, was that almost everybody is shopping online. Right. And numbers like even five or six years ago, numbers like 60% of the people were very frequently or frequently shopping online. But we know that nowhere near 60% or 70%, unless you're DigiKey, of the revenue is going through the shopping cart. That means that it's going somewhere else. It means it's going potentially to one of these lights out order processing channels, or it means it's going to more traditional channels, a phone call, maybe even a fax. Can you believe fax is still alive in 2022? It is? No, but I uh, believe, I mean, I can. I know it's for live, but I can't believe it. Um, so yeah, so that this this gap between the percentage of people that shop online versus the percent who put stuff in the e-commerce uh, that was apparent six years ago. It's changed. It's come up, but it's it's nowhere near. Actually, the percent who shop online has, has come up commensurately as well. So um, so those those have to be going elsewhere, and that is a really strong uh, assist um, for for people that are thinking in in that way. Hey, Jonathan, I put the I put links to the ROI webinar that we're talking about okay. and the ROI white paper in the chat. Okay. So if you're on the live session, you can get it in the chat. If you're on the podcast or watching the video, uh, just reach out to us or go to distributionstrategy.com, look at uh, events or, uh, or I think uh, the other one is white papers, yeah, uh, probably white report papers. reports, There's yeah. go to events or reports and you'll see the, uh, uh, the white paper is called ROI considerations for e-commerce. Um, and uh, the event is uh the where is it here oh that's upcoming events uh it was called sorry it, it was called the real roi of e-commerce for distributors so yes. uh these resources are available and it's, and it's really compelling here's what we found in in the research that we did so we looked at we looked at who bought the most for both of these companies. Um, we broke things down into deciles. And then we also, we broke them into deciles by, by how digitally engaged they were. And when we say digitally engaged, we were looking at simply as the number of visits they made to the website. So we weren't looking at clicks or, or views or anything. Um, and what we found was that digitally engaged customers and those that visit the websites recently by way, way, way more online and offline than less frequent website visitors. Hmm. And, and to take it a step further, very digitally engaged customers buy much more online and offline than, than others. Um, so again, we're talking about a situation where it's a 1% through the e-commerce site. The most digitally engaged customers are buying way more offline than, than others. And then even a further data point about the value of this large customers are much more digitally engaged. So digital, digital engagement um, correlates pretty strongly to, to customer, customer size. Yeah. And so we also worked on uh, a methodology for estimating the percentage of your offline orders that were influenced or should be attributed to the website. That's and right. Do you want to go through that? Um, well, yeah, so it's it's pretty simply. We're just we're looking at the percentage of clicks that are product related. That was the Google Analytics example I just gave. And then taking some portion of that and considering that to be an assist. Yeah, but there's another way too, right? Which is that you can just call some customers back and ask them. Ah. There you go. You know, and and, I, and I've, I've talked to several distributors. I mean, I, I say this in my keynotes and I've talked to several distributors that are doing this. And I haven't told you this, but I talked to uh, one association and they want to have a follow-up call because some of the distributors are working on this and, I, and they're going to give me some feedback. That's um, great. But the, the notion is, you know, look, you can do a lot with analytics. You can do a lot with software, but you know what? It's always a good idea just to call some customers every month and see how things are going you know, like a customer service check. So why not take, you know, 30, 50, 100 orders a month that were not placed through the website, call the customer back, say, you don't have to, it's not a sales call. I'm just checking in to see how the experience was. While I have you on the phone, did you use our website in the process of putting together this order? If the answer is yes, give the website some or all of the attribution. If the answer is no, then don't. And you can 
you know, first of all, it's a great chance for you to get your senior executives some customer facing time, <laughs> have them make the calls, give 10 orders to 10 different executives and have them make the calls. Or if you don't want to do that, give it to an intern. But, you know, it's a very simple way to tabulate the impact of your website on your total orders by just reaching out to customers and asking them. It doesn't have to be complicated. Absolutely. Uh, sim simple is good. We have a great comment here from a very knowledgeable member of our audience. Um, B2B sales has become more about using data to orchestrate processes that are more personalized for the buyer, knowing that they've already done probably 70 to 80% of their research online. Uh, and reference stories from other customers help B2B sales reps validate the quality of their offerings. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know from research, so thank you, Stephen that buyers are doing most of their research online, no matter how they're paying, they're placing the order. That's right. So if they're not using your website to do the research. They're not likely to put the purchase through you. Yeah. So we have a question from Ron, a dedicated listener and good friend of mine, actually. Ron, have you done any analysis or have thoughts on how outside salespeople impact the online purchases? Many times compensation, sales credit, and other incentives motivate or not, depending on what channel the orders are placed. Um, I like the analysis that e-commerce means different things to different organizations and how they measure, right? So this is a really important point, right? So uh, I'm glad you like the analysis, Ron, but your question is spot on. If you put- As the, usual. Yeah, I know, right, exactly. If you put the sales force in competition with the website, they'll kill it. Yeah, right. and that's another thing that we've seen in the research that we've done is that the when we look at ways to drive e-commerce revenue, um, there's, a, there's a list of 10, there's a choice of 10. Um, the top three are almost always something related to people, meaning your field sales rep, your, your, your customer service rep, your um, proactive insight sales rep, and then you get into things like search. Um, so your, your, e your salespeople, your customer facing personnel can make or break the initiative. Yep. And if you, if you give them the, the wrong incentives, they will, they will break your initiative. Yeah. So here's a question. Uh, maybe it's for you, Jonathan, maybe it's for the audience. For how many of you does your sales force know and believe that digital engagement engagement will make their customers buy more over time, even if they don't buy online, do they know and believe that digital engagement is an important part of growing and retaining those customers? Because our data demonstrates very convincingly that it does. Yeah. But if the sales reps are discouraging that engagement because they're afraid or threatened by, afraid of or threatened by the website, and they're discouraging use of it by the customers. And I've been with sales reps on sales calls where they say, don't go to the website, call me. Then they are hurting themselves. I mean, unless you're not paying commissions for website sales, which is just a self-inflicted wound, right? But, yeah. it, but if, you, if, if, if your sales reps actually understood, so if you, like, if you go through that paper that, that Dean did, and I know you helped him with, Jonathan, and you watch that webinar that you two did, and you understand that, oh my gosh, when I get my customers digitally engaged, they buy more from me through all channels and I retain them longer and I can use it to land new customers. If people actually understood that in the sales organization and believed it, they would be encouraging and advocating for this digital engagement. But if they view it as a threat, which is silly because you can't build a relationship with a website. It's just a way to add value. It can enrich the relationship, but you can't build it with a relationship. But if the sales reps are afraid of it or threatened by it and they discourage use, usage of it, they're hurting themselves. But I don't think most sales organizations understand that and believe it. Do you? I think it varies, but yeah, I think there's a large swath who are, are threatened by it. Look, the, the truth is in the long run, the the number of field sales reps will probably decline somewhat because of e-commerce, yep. right? And it, it goes back to, we could reference the study by Andy Hoare on the death of a B2B salesperson, which in one quadrant had very consultative sales reps, and then in the other opposite quadrant of a caddy corner, I like cats, um, it had the order takers. And the order takers 
the people whose main value is, is order taking, <laughs> they're going to be fewer of those jobs o- over the years. So there, there is a reality to sure. the fact that there will be, there will be fewer positions because of self-service through digital. Oh, I don't think there's any question. I think the requirements to be a great sales rep are increasing. Yes. They're getting harder, right? So you need to be more consultative. You need to be more uh, value added for the customer. But if those sales go away because you're not adding enough value, or if those if that position goes away because you're not adding enough value, the question is, are those sales going to go to your company or your competitor's company? Because someone's going to offer them digital value one way or the other. So, you know, it, it, it's... I think that there's going to be a place for good salespeople for a long time. There's no question. I mean, you know, cause I know you recently made sales calls and I make them whenever I can with distributors. And, you know, for the most part, those companies wouldn't be buying from those distributors if it weren't for those salespeople. Yeah. The, the sales call I made yesterday was a company that is, is a really good customer of this distributor and the sales rep 30 year vet, was able to recommend the right products, which saved them all kinds of money. And I don't right. mean I don't mean just um, the price of the product. Right. I'm talking about the the productivity benefits that they gained in in their manufacturing process. And it was clear how I would say even indebted that customer felt to the sales rep. And that's yeah. like three commerce. You know what I'd equate it to, Jonathan, is if you you know you live in the company's based in Boulder, Colorado, and Boulder has one of the world's best hardware stores called McGuckin Hardware. And you can't walk in there for two minutes without someone asking you if you need help. And if it's been two minutes, it feels like wow, they've taken an unusually long time today to ask me if I need help. So I remember one time I had a home project and I went into Home Depot. And I was trying to figure out what I needed. And I had a bunch of stuff on this, on this flatbed. And I finally just put it all back. Cause I'm like, I'm not sure this is the right stuff. I'm not a home improvement wizard. So then I went over to McGuckin's and I ran into this guy who said, Oh, you need this and this and this and this. And he sold me half as much stuff as I was about to buy at home Depot. I don't know if I paid more at McGuckin on a margin basis on a, you know, cost per unit basis, but I sure saved money on the whole order because I didn't buy a bunch of stuff I didn't need because he was an expert and I wasn't. And that's the kind of stuff that salespeople can do in distribution. Yeah, f- funny story. My, my dad got into woodworking um, in this like, probably about our age. And he did it until well into his eighties. I took him to McGuckin's once. I could not get him out of there. I mean, <laughs> it, it was like the kid in the candy store. In this case, right. it was the dad in the hardware store. And I, right. I, just, I could not pry him loose from that store. And that's how people feel when they deal with knowledgeable personnel and good quality products from a professional organization, rather than, you know, just blindly searching around online on a website where they, they don't know what they're doing. Um, so we have another uh, comment from Steve. You want to go through this one, Jonathan? You another great contribution. Yes. Um, Steve on point as usual, B2B sales reps should be omni-channel sales reps, only account, not the ordering process. Uh, I love that's that. absolutely right. Right. Spot on. The B2B sales rep rep's role is no longer to educate the B2B buyer on products, but to have a conversation about what like-minded customers did successfully and why they should join the ranks. In addition, yeah, and, go, ahead, go ahead, please. Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so yeah, I would agree. Generally speaking, I do think that product knowledge remains important though, Steve. And, and I think that uh, product margin product knowledge is part of the consultative value that you add to a customer, you know? So I was talking to a distributor the other day and they had saved their customer a bunch of money in a production application, right? They had recommended some products that actually made production faster. Um, And that comes from technical expertise. To your point, it's not necessarily specific product knowledge. It's sort of, you know, production knowledge, but you know, the point is application knowledge, really? Yes. Right. And, and, understanding production systems in this case. So, you know, I, I think that, but I have also worked with sales reps that didn't have a lot of technical knowledge, but they were so value added in other ways um, that the, the customers really valued them. So, um, so I think, you know, that the takeaway here is that you've got to build 
a fantastic website. But what it makes it fantastic is going to depend on the sector you're in and what your customers' needs are. That, go ahead. Go ahead. That the way you measure that website has to be a hell of a lot more robust than what am I, what are the gross margin dollars coming through my shopping cart? That is such a de minimis view of the website benefits. And so if you're looking at, you know, effects of digital engagement on customer long-term lifetime value and, and what orders that don't come through the shopping cart are actually being generated in part or in full by your website. And, you, you know, you're understanding the real strategic contribution of your website, which you and I believe you can quantify, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to guess. I mean, it's always going to be an estimate to some degree, mm -hmm. but it's going to be immeasurably more accurate than just the gross margin dollars through my shopping cart. Yes. Then what you'll find is two things. One is you've been hugely underinvesting in your website. You've probably in some ways built the wrong website because you, you're in this retail mindset where I'm going to drive conversion of the shopping cart as the main goal, rather than that being sort of a tertiary mm -hmm. objective of the website. And you are way under investing in digital technology. And that's where we get into what we call the digital doom loop, right? Right. Where you've under invested. Now it seems like it's failing. So you invest even less. So now you fail worse. And you hear these in Congress statements like, well, I guess my customers just don't like to buy online. There is no audience like that anymore. Yeah, and then I think the third one related to that is if you're gonna set a big, hairy, audacious goal, let it be around the lights out order processing percentage. So mm -hmm. rather than saying we need to get to 30% e-commerce, e-commerce should be part of that, set a goal for can we get to 50% lights out order processing, including e-commerce, including EDI, including punch out, including email or vending, vending machines. Vending machines, right? Yeah. And what happens when you get to 50%, just, just on the order entry costs alone, it ends up being about 30 to 40 basis points of productivity. I mean, it's a really material number. If you mm. think about it to your bottom line, because you're, you're, you're literally taking that much cost out of your system. Right. Uh, when you talk to people who spend oh, this customer I was with yesterday, they, they spend 60% of the time doing order entry from orders. Isn't that incredible? 60%. So, so yeah, so, so set a big, hairy, audacious goal around lights out order processing of which shopping cart revenue is a component. Well, I think we're ready to wrap up, Jonathan. Do you? I think we're there. All right. Well, Thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you for your questions. A couple of upcoming events that you might be interested in. On September 21st at noon Eastern, we have Competing and Winning with Value Added Services presented by Frank Hurt, who literally wrote the book, The Distributor Manifesto on Value Added Services or something like that. It's on Amazon. It's a great book. I've read it. Um, that's brought to you by Epicor, who regularly sponsors our content. So thank you, Epicor, for that. On September 22nd, we have our next episode of The Discerning Distributor with Alex Chalsovsky. So while the Wholesale Change Show tends to focus on sort of internal operations and issues and leadership for distributors, Alex focuses on the macro environment. So he talks about talent, supply chain, et cetera. Um, and so I encourage you to check that out. You can go to distributionstrategy.com and click on events. Uh, if you want to learn more information, our contact information is also on the website. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, go and measure your website website well, uh, design it so that it uh, generates maximum value. We quit obsessing about the shopping cart. Get all you can through the shopping cart, but get through get uh, get the other benefits as well. Jonathan, as always, it's been just uh, wonderful working with you. Mutual, Ian. All right, everyone, take care. We'll see you on the next episode of Wholesale Change. Bye now. <laughs>